So when we think about uh, big law firm lawyers, I think a lot of times we think about super large mergers or battles between two big entities, you know, you know, big, two big corporations fighting it out in court. And there is a fair amount of that. And I think by contrast, when we think about the litigation that affects the, the critical issues of the day, I think more often we think about Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP, or we think about the types of lawyers that uh, Dean Galyuboff wrote about in her book, the, the small practitioner kind of battling away, um, or the, the lawyer at the nonprofit. And, and so much of the development of the law in these areas are coming from exactly that. Um, but there is also, there's a very storied tradition of the, of the nation's large law firms contributing uh, to the big issues of our day. And the, the talk today is um, certainly a great example of that. When I think back on some of these, like if you've ever read, um, if you've ever read Gideon's Trumpet, uh, the story of Gideon versus Wainwright, the, you know, the law firm Arnold and Porter in DC plays a huge role in establishing the, uh, you know, the right to counsel for, for indigent defendants. Um, folks who are my age, there's not too many in this room, remember um, Oliver North in front of the Congressional subcommittee and his and his ferocious advocate Brendan Sullivan from Williams and Connolly next to him um, you know objecting to the Congress's uh, to the Congress's questions and eventually one of the senators admonished him and said you know you've got to stop and and he said sir I am not a potted plant um, I am a lawyer representing my client and it was a great moment right and uh, and uh, more recently if we think of David Boyes from Boyes Schiller and Ted Olson from Gibson Dunn taking on um, you know the California ban on same-sex marriage. There are many of these instances. Firms really excel at cases that require kind of a fast or a sustained deployment of large numbers of talented lawyers on something where you need a lot of talent to focus in fast on something um, and, and or over a sustained period of time where the cost of the representation is going to be high. And I think firms realize that representations of this nature not only affect their external uh, reputation, but really, really bolster a firm's internal uh, culture, um, make people proud to, to work at, uh, at, that, at that firm. And that brings me to the story, I guess, of how a senior law firm associate ends up in a position where she is arguing the critical argument to strike the administration's travel ban against the acting solicitor general of the United States. Like, no pressure on that, right? So our next speaker, um, Colleen Rowe Sinsdak, um, is a uh, senior associate at the law firm Hogan Lovells. She was born into a family of lawyers, so when she got to Columbia University, naturally she turned herself, you know, wholeheartedly and devotedly to a career um, teaching English literature. And when she graduated from college, she did go on to Cambridge and she got her master's in English literature and she taught in the UK and the United States for, for a number of years. But it seems that, as is the case for so many people who come to law school, there was something in the back of her head that kept, that kept gnawing at her and, uh, and, and kind of pulling her in that direction. Um, and in 2007, she started classes at, at Harvard Law School. Um, and so, so she's part of like this, this wonderful modern tradition of people coming from prior careers and bringing that experience and expertise to law school, which has so kind of helped our classrooms and, our, and, our, and the practice of law generally. Um, and when she went to Harvard, Colleen told me she really was not thinking that, uh, that, that big law was the, was the way that um, she was going to proceed after she finished, um, and in fact worked in the summer at the federal programs branch of the Department of Justice, which is ironic because that's who she ends up litigating against in the, uh, in the travel ban, uh, in the travel ban cases. So after law school, she clerked for Judge Merrick Garland on the DC Circuit, and then went on to clerk for Chief Justice John Roberts, and this was a very kind of productive, exciting clerkship, in part because the healthcare cases were coming through at that time, in part because she ends up meeting and, and marrying one of her co-clerks from down the hall, so like this huge pooling of collective IQ. Um, <laughs> and it, kind of in another of those wonderful career twists that makes my job such a joy, like she does actually end up in, um, in Big Ferg practice, and she ends up um, at Hogan with, with the former um, acting solicitor general, Neil Catchell, who she's litigated this case with, along with a, um, a team. And, and so at Hogan, she's, she's briefed and argued cases in multiple courts of appeals. She's worked on multiple matters before uh, the United States Supreme Court, including this one. But really most significantly, I guess for purposes of this, of this is that in March 2017, she ends up on the front line arguing this case in the District of Hawaii against the second, um, against the second uh, travel ban. Um, and. Uh, the, as I said, the, the, you know, the, 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 oppo the opposing counsel in the case is the acting solicitor general. And as you, know, as you likely know, she prevailed on that argument um, and was promptly named the American Lawyers uh, Litigator of the Week. Um, and 
since that time has continued to work um, tenaciously on this case, um, the team, I think she'll probably tell you, is you know, faced at times what probably would seem to many of us as almost impossible deadlines as they worked to address the, emer the issues that have emerged over the course of this. The, the, the issue, the, the procedure of the case is very complicated, and I will leave it to her to decide what she wants to highlight for that. But like, let me wind up by saying, kind of as a former litigator and an old guy, how wonderful it is to see a big firm associate get an opportunity like this and capitalize on that opportunity um, at, the, at the very center of our nation's politics is something that's critically important. And I hope that for all the students, like you will really look at this and take note and understand just how big your practice can be and what the, and what the, what the opportunities are for you if you are open uh, to the opportunities that come. Um, with that, I give you Colleen Rowe Sinstead. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you very much to the um, the journal for bringing me here, um, and 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 for all of the sponsors uh, for the symposium. It's been a, a really wonderful um, set of of meetings today. I've learned a lot, um, and and I appreciate in particular that you've brought me here to talk about a subject which is very close to my heart, which is the role of big law firms in um, in in immigration litigation, uh, and that that subject is close to my heart because of, in, in, in part because of March, uh, March 15th, 2017, and that argument um, for the state of Hawaii and for Dr. Ishmael El Sheikh, where we needed to convince a Hawaii district court to enjoin the president's second executive order, uh, barring immigration from six Muslim-majority countries and barring uh, refugee admissions worldwide for 120 days. We needed to convince the judge um, to put an injunction in place uh, that night so that the, to prevent the order from going into effect the next day. Uh, and, and my job was to explain why that order was unconstitutional, why it violated the Establishment Clause, why this order was what I think every reasonable observer knew it to be, which is um, the implementation of the President's promised Muslim ban. And, and, and we know that, that we succeeded, uh, which is, I think, why that moment is, is at, the, it is at the, 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 the pinnacle of my legal career. And, and it was, in, in many ways, what I had dreamed of when I went to law school. Um, it was a moment where I was able to litigate uh, a, a case that was going to matter to thousands of people, where um, it was going to have the capacity to reunite families, to bring people to the United States who badly needed to be here in order to escape dangers in their home countries. Um, and, and it was a case that was going to determine whether the United States was going to, in my mind, remain um, true to the, the constitutional values that, are, 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 uh, that, that, that we have committed to. Um, so, so it was, in many ways, exactly what I had dreamed of uh, when I went to law school. But in one fundamental way, it was very, very different because I wasn't working for the ACLU and I wasn't working for a good-hearted government. I wasn't working for a nonprofit. I was working for Hogan Levels. I was an associate at Big Law. Um, and if you had told me when I was in law school that the way that I was going to get to litigate a major, a major immigration case, the way that I was going to get to really make a big difference would be by joining Big Law, I, I would have laughed. To me, Big Law was, I think, synonymous with what it is probably for many people in this room, which was a soulless entity um, that, that, that's co totally committed to making money and, and that joining that sort of entity um, would make you into, into something like that. Um, obviously, today, my viewpoint is very, very different. Uh, that's in part because of um, Hawaii versus Trump, in part because of Hogan Lovells' uh, contributions to that. But I, I think if you look at it, it's not, it's not just Hogan Lovells that has been um, litigating the travel ban cases. In fact, Big Law has been participating in this case in, in many ways. Um, so uh, the, uh, there's a parallel Fourth Circuit litigation um, where several of the parties are represented by big law firms. Um, there are, I think, Perhaps every big law firm has filed an amicus brief at some point um, in one of the iterations of this case. 
Uh, and big law firms are involved in the other major immigration uh, suits that are going on right now. So the sanctuary cities litigation that is happening all over the country where cities are suing to prevent the federal government from punishing them um, for, uh, for, for being sanctuaries for undocumented immigrants. That litigation, much of that is being done by uh, big law firms. Hogan Lovells um, has been uh, representing the city of Philadelphia. And in fact, one of my colleagues, Sarah Solo, who's been working on uh, the Trump, uh, uh, the Hawaii litigation, has actually been doing double duty and litigating that, that sanctuary cities case. She just had a big win in the district court that we're currently defending before the Third Circuit. Um, the DACA litigation is also being handled in part by law firms. Uh, Covington and Burling is currently representing the regents at the University of California, um, and I believe Gibson Dunn, uh, which, if you know, private law is not not the bastion of uh, liberal advocacy that you might think of it, but Gibson Dunn uh, is representing the um, in some individual DACA recipients in the litigation before the Supreme Court. So big law really is participating in the major in the major cases um, that are uh, for immigration law that are happening right now, and um, big law also participates in the individual cases um, brought by. Uh, by immigrants or, um, or where immigrants are, are attempting to fend off deportation or other things. Uh, if you look again at the Supreme Court's doc docket over the last uh, several years and you find the immigration cases, you'll see that the big law firms are defending the immigrants in most of those cases. Um, if, if you look lower down, the big law firms are involved in, at all different levels. Uh, I know this from the very small sample size of my family. Um, my, uh, my husband was an associate at Wilmer Hale, and when he was there, his big pro bono project was representing an immigrant who was contesting his deportation before the Ninth Circuit. Uh, my sister uh, works as an associate at Paul Weiss in New York, um, and she has given much of her pro bono time to, uh, uh, to helping a woman obtain as as asylum because her husband um, was abusing her and there was sort of state-sponsored domestic abuse. So that's a very small sample size, but I happen to know that it does, in fact, reflect um, what is going on in big law, which a, a major part of big law's uh, pro bono docket is, is immigration cases. Um, so I want to look today at, at, at the role of big law, and I want to do that um, in three specific ways. First of all, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit more about the um, Hawaii versus Trump litigation, which I could talk about forever and ever. Um, uh, but I want to use that for, for a purpose, which is to look at, uh, first, why big law is becoming so involved in this immigration litigation, what, what advantages it has for big law firms. And second, I want to look at what big law is bringing to the table when it is participating um, in these firms. Uh, so to begin with the story of Hawaii versus Trump, and I need to put a caveat here because it is a, a case that is still being litigated. Um, we are currently briefing our challenge to the third executive order before the Supreme Court. We're actually supposed to get, I think, the government brief in today, um, and there will be an oral argument in April. Because of that, I need to stick to the publicly available legal arguments, and I'm not going to give you my sense of the strengths or weaknesses of um, those arguments, uh, although perhaps if you find me sometime after after the court has ruled, I can can give you my thoughts on that. Um, so, but 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 to begin with the story of um, Hawaii versus Trump, which which uh, begins as 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 you as I'm sure m many of you know on on January 27th, 2017, a day that is I think impossible for most people in the immigration community to forget. Um, that is when the President Trump, uh, one week into office, released his first executive order preventing the immigration from seven Muslim majority countries and um, preventing refugee admissions worldwide for 120 days, but indefinitely suspending uh, uh, the refugees from Syria. Um, that, that policy went into effect immediately. It created chaos. I think we've heard about that in some of the earlier, um, earlier panels today. It created chaos. It, it, it separated families. It meant that people who needed emergency medical care in the United States were unable to get it. Um, also, people just didn't know who exactly this law applied to or how to apply it. Um, so, and I think on top of all of that, 
was a sense that this chaos wasn't the result of a policy that had been carefully researched and thought out as a response to any particular danger. Rather, it was President Trump's means of implementing his campaign promise to, uh, to, to implement a, a Muslim ban. So lawyers, I think, in particular, felt a call to arms from this, and those of us at Hogan Levels were no different. I, um, I had sent my boss, uh, Neil Katyal, an email uh, Saturday morning after this ban happened saying, I will do literally anything to fight this ban. Um, and I think, uh, uh, unbeknownst to me, several of my colleagues had done exactly the same thing. Um, Neil is a, is a good person to email in situations like this. As, as has been said, he, is the, he um, is, was, is the former acting Solicitor General under President Obama. He was the advocate who litigated the Hamdan case, one of the major Guantanamo Bay cases, and won that before the Supreme Court. Uh, he's also been involved in many of the major civil rights issues of our, our, of our day. So when you're looking for somebody that to, um, to spearhead an effort uh, in the civil rights arena, he's a good person to email. Um, and, and while Hogan Lovells was sort of uh, getting motivated in that way, the state of Hawaii and lawyers from the state of Hawaii were looking at uh, the executive order, and they were seeing frightening reflections of the Japanese internment program uh, from World War II. And the state of Hawaii, uh, the, 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 that sort of thing has particular salience because um, there was actually an internment camp in the state of Hawaii. And so the, the, that state feels a special commitment uh, to avoid our country's repetition of the mistakes of that time period. So they were feeling like they needed to be fighting this. And what more natural connection than the state of Hawaii, which is an ocean and many time zones away, and Hogan Lovell's appellate group. Um, but in fact, that was a very natural connection because uh, Neil had been doing um, some Supreme Court work for, uh, for the state of Hawaii in other capacities. So that, that was a pre-existing relationship that we were able to kindle right away. And by Sunday, we had scheduled our first conference call, our first transoceanic conference call with lawyers from um, the state of Hawaii and lawyers from Hogan Lovells. Uh, and at that conference, in that conference call, we started to sketch out how we were going to um, challenge the travel ban. Now, that, uh, that conference call, we could not possibly know exactly what, uh, what we were planning because um, we would, we, we, that, that call was the beginning of um, over a year of litigation and counting in which we have challenged three separate iterations of the president's um, uh, travel ban. So that first iteration was the one that was released on January 27th. And we actually um, filed on behalf of the state of Hawaii a complaint and a request for an injunction against that ban. We filed that on February 3rd, so um, a, a week after the um, order had been released. That part of our litigation, however, was stayed because shortly after, and literally a few hours after we filed our papers, um, a Washington State Federal, or sorry, a Washington Federal District Court um, issued an injunction against the ban. The Ninth Circuit very quickly affirmed that, and uh, the government, for once recognizing a losing game when they saw it, decided not to continue defending that, um, that iteration of the executive order. They decided that instead they would um, attempt to put in place a new, a new iteration with, as the president and his aides helpfully informed us, the same basic policy um, with a few technical changes designed to get it through the courts. Uh, with, with that sort of advance warning, um, we knew that we needed to be ready for the second uh, executive order when it came out. Um, we wanted to be ready to challenge it um, if, if it, in fact, looked like um, the, 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 another iteration of the president's promised Muslim ban. And sure enough, on March 6th, when uh, the president unveiled his second executive order, uh, but uh, it looked very similar to the first. It was the same basic policy with some technical changes. Um, so it again barred uh, Im uh, immigration, barred entry from nationals of six, this time, Muslim-majority countries. Um, and it barred, again, uh, 
refugee admissions worldwide for 120 days. It also did something you may have heard referred to in the earlier, um, earlier panels. It lowered the refugee cap. So there had been scheduled under President Obama, there were supposed to be 110,000 refugees entering the country in 2017. And the executive order lowered that number to 50,000. Um, we knew we needed to fight this, this order. Uh, and, and we actually had papers ready to be filed two days after the order came out. So on March 8th, we were the, um, we, we filed on behalf of Hawaii and an individual plaintiff, Dr. Ishmael El Sheikh, who is a, um, an imam of a mosque in Hawaii. We filed the first complaint and the first for a request for an injunction again against the executive order. And when we were then able to get a very aggressive briefing schedule that had a hearing on March 15th, and then, um, the, then therefore we were able to obtain an injunction of that before the order ever went into effect. Uh, and we were also able to actually defend that injunction before the Ninth Circuit. So the injunction rem remained in place um, through March, April, May. In June, we came to the Supreme Court, which, uh, which where we got a little bit less than a full victory. Um, the Supreme Court, the government asked the Supreme Court to fully stay the injunction, and it asked the court to hear the case on the merits. And the court agreed to hear the case on the merits in October, and it partially stayed the injunction. So the court said that the travel and refugee bans could go into effect, but um, it limited their effect to uh, uh, foreign nationals that did not have a bona fide relationship with an individual or an entity in the United States. So that meant that the order could only um, be enforced against people who, at least if you took the Supreme Court at its word, which the government did not, um, it could only be enforced against people who didn't have relationships with the United States. Um, and that actually was the, the Supreme Court's last word on the second executive order because uh, the bans went into place and the travel ban actually expired before oral argument was set to occur. The court then took the, the case off its calendar and when the refugee ban expired, the case was um, declared, the Supreme Court declared the case moot and uh, dismissed the litigation. But as, as you know, we're still litigating, so that was not the end of the story. Um, then the, the, the president then passed on the very day that the second, um, the 90-day ban in the second executive order expired, the president passed um, his third uh, attempt at a travel ban. It's a little bit different. Um, it reaches a slightly different mix of countries, still overwhelmingly Muslim majority, but this time it adds North Korea, uh, which sends approximately one person to the United States a year. Um, and uh, it adds, a, it also targets a very small handful of unfortunate Venezuelan government officials. Um, but otherwise, it is targeting Muslim majority countries. Um, and it is, it is, it has banned the um, entry of immigrant visa holders from those countries. So that means that people cannot come here with the intent to stay. Um, it's also banned uh, most or, or many, depending on the country, um, forms of um, uh, entry by the holders of non-immigrant visas. So it's much more difficult to visit from those countries, and for some of them it's actually impossible. And as, as you may be aware, um, it, it made all of those bans indefinite. Um, and so this is, in, in some ways, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a less of an order than, than in the past, but in, in this major way, it's much more of an order because uh, there is no end game on this. Um, we uh, successfully obtained an injunction against that third order as well from the district court that this time didn't even hold a hearing. Uh, and we defended that injunction uh, against the Ninth Circuit. Um, uh, but uh, it is currently in place because the Supreme Court, um, as soon as we got our injunction from the district court, the government went to um, the Supreme Court and asked for a stay. And this time, the Supreme Court granted the stay in full. So that, that, that third executive order, the travel ban is in place. It's being enforced now. And it will be in place unless we can prevail at the Supreme Court in um, in April. So um, I think uh, uh, President Trump has done a, a masterful job of doing enough other things to draw the news away from this terrible thing that he did at the beginning of his um, presidency. But it is, it is going on, and it is having very real uh, consequences. Um, so we have been litigating that. that those, are sort of, those were sort of the three iterations of, of the travel ban that we have challenged. In litigating that, to give you a sense of exactly what we've been doing, we have filed 29 briefs um, in a little over a year. We have filed 13 briefs in the district court. 
We have filed seven briefs in the Ninth Circuit, and we have filed eight briefs before the Supreme Court. We also filed one lonely little amicus brief in the Fourth Circuit in that parallel case. Um, those, that, that works out to the 29 briefs. It works out to about a brief every two weeks. Um, but in fact, we were doing the briefs on much, much more compressed schedules than that. Um, the, when, when we were able to obtain an injunction against the order, the government would argue that we needed to go as quickly as possible because of the national security threats. When the government was able to obtain a stay, we would argue that we needed to go as quickly as possible because we needed to get people into the country, we needed to reunite families, um, we needed to bring refugees in. And that, so there was kind of, there was always urgency on both sides. So. 36 hours uh, uh, for a brief became to us sort of par for the course. Um, I was looking and there was a week in July where we filed three briefs in 72 hours. Um, and there was a day in September where uh, at noon we filed our merits brief in the Supreme Court. The government, about an hour later, in its extreme generosity, filed a stay request regarding a different aspect of the case. We had to then write and uh, file another brief opposing that stay request by 9 p.m. the next day. So we have the dubious distinction of having filed two briefs in the Supreme Court in, in less than 24 hours, um, which is a record that I think we are all desperately hoping not to, not to break in this case, although you should really never say never. Um, so we've been, we've been litigating this case, uh, and, in, and, and, and in, in terms of doing all of this briefing, um, it, it hasn't been on easy issues. Uh, we, we've really been writing the playbook as we have been following it. Uh, there hasn't been litigation like this before because there haven't been presidential immigration policies like this before. Uh, so we haven't, we, we haven't had models to, to follow and the government has taken every opportunity it can find to challenge us. So the government, you know, their opening position was, well, the courts can't even look at these cases. Um, this isn't justiciable. This is something, you know, the president, this is something for the president and Congress to work out. Uh, so we had to find ways of explaining to the courts why no, they did have, in fact, a constitutional responsibility to do, perform judicial review, and they did very much have a role in these cases. Um, the, uh, the government has argued that we aren't the right plaintiffs, that Hawaii isn't the right plaintiffs, that uh, isn't the right plaintiff, that the individual people haven't yet been denied a visa, and we've had to find arguments against that. Um, on the merits, the, uh, the government has taken the position that the president has essentially unfettered statutory power to ban people from this country. And we've had to go to the Immigration and Naturalization Act and point out where those statutory limits are, point out why, in fact, the president does not have unlimited statutory discretion to do what he wants in terms of excluding individuals. Uh, on the constitutional element of things, we have had to both convince the courts that yes, they can weigh in on, on, the, pres on the constitutionality of the president's actions in, the, in this forum, but we've also ha uh, ha had the task of explaining why when the president has made statements indicating an intent to enforce um, a Muslim ban, why courts can look at those statements, why courts don't have to, as the government has argued over and over again, close their eyes to all external evidence of um, intent in the policy. Uh, so, so these have been big questions for us to litigate, and I'm sort of actually short-circuiting it because that doesn't even mention that doesn't even cover um, the sort of grandmas and refugees portion of the litigation, uh, which also was happening this summer, you may have seen in the news, and that was all concerning um, not, not, not the mer major merits questions underlying the suit, but actually just what the Supreme Court meant when it implemented its partial stay. Uh, that created a, um, a, a real raft of litigation as we fought with the government over um, who had a bona fide relationship with someone in the United States. And this is where um, the government came up with the position that uh, you do not, your close family does not include aunts, uncles, cousins, or grandmothers. Um, and uh, that actually, I litigated that portion of the case at the Ninth Circuit where I got to hear a judge say to, um, say to, to the government lawyer, what universe does your understanding of close family come from? Which was a very satisfying moment in this, uh, in this, in this litigation. Um, and, and there have been many similar moments and I wish that I um, could just tell war stories um, from, from this case. I've actually joked with some of my friends that they should make a, um, 
a television show, perhaps that only I would watch, in which um, they went through sort of all of the twists and turns and the, um, the positive moments and then the, the, the moments where it seemed like we were losing. Um, but at any rate, I will have to wait for um, who's that? Uh, Aaron Sorkin to pick up on that. Um, <clears throat> because what I, I, I do want to use the Hawaii versus Trump story uh, to think about the role of big law in these um, immigration, immigration cases. And I want to do that in two ways. The first is looking at why big law firms are getting involved in cases like this. Um, and the second, as I say, is looking at what, what they're bringing to the table. Um, and in terms of, of why big law is getting involved, I want to start with an answer that I think should be obvious, but again, I think based on the public perception of, of law firms is not. Uh, I think the major reason that big law firms are getting involved is because it's the right thing to do. Um, I think that, 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 that big law firms are made up of lawyers. They're made up of lawyers like most of the people in this room. Um, people who see how important it is to our country to have a reasonable immigration policy. People who understand what it means in terms of lives on the line when we prevent refugees from coming, when we prevent people who need safety in our, in our country from entering the United States, and, and people who want to be on the right side of the fight in that, in that respect. Um, you know, after the, 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 we obtained the first injunction uh, in Hawaii, I got a lot of emails from partners at Hogan Lovells that just said, we are so glad the firm is part of this. Um, and and I, th I think that is really the major, the major reason that, that big law is getting involved, is because they want to be doing something. They want, the stakes are so high, and they want to be um, doing what they can. But I don't think that's the, that's the only advantage. And I, I, I think there's, that, that, that other advantages are probably um, somewhat in play in permitting you know, the extreme expend, expend, uh, expensive resources that cases like this really do, um, do, do take. And, uh, and I think the first uh, of, of the advantages, the sort of tangible advantages for law firms, um, comes in the form of recruiting. Uh, as those of you who are currently going through law firm recruiting would know, law firms are constantly trying to distinguish themselves from one another. And when a firm can say, well, our firm is involved in Hawaii versus Trump, that really, that makes a big difference. Um, I, I serve on our firm's recruiting committee and I've seen the effect that that, that has. Um, and then there's retention. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, in the introduction, we talked a little bit about, um, about, about it feeling pretty good to walk in the door of a, of a law firm, uh, of, a, of an entity, and feel like your, your firm is doing, something, um, is doing something good for the world. I know after, um, after President Trump's inauguration, in speaking to friends in big law, many of them felt like they needed to be leaving. They needed to go somewhere else to do something more meaningful with their careers. And, and I didn't feel that way because I felt like I was at Big Law and I was doing the most meaningful th thing I could do um, uh, uh, and, and within the co with, by staying at the firm. And so I think retention, recruitment, those are big advantages. Um, you know, a third, a third big advantage is the preparation and the experience uh, that we get from cases like this that we can then transfer to paying clients. Um, this case has involved learning how to write briefs on, on a dime, learning how to think creatively. There have been so many sort of procedural twists, figuring out how to even get a challenge, um, get the right kind of challenge before the right court, uh, and, 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 and working out the procedural nuances of the federal court system. Once you've got that knowledge, that's transferable. That's something you can bring to your, uh, to your other clients. Um, you know, speaking personally, uh, there's also been this oral argument experience that I just could not have had in any other context. So I, the first argument in, uh, in March was against the acting solicitor general. I then argued uh, a little bit in later, in later March, I was arguing against the um, acting head of the civil division of DOJ. And in, uh, in August, I was arguing against the head of civil appellate. And um, you know, those maybe it doesn't sound that exciting, but to an appellate advocate, that's sort of, that's sort of the, the, the holy grail. Um, and I think that, you know, but for Hawaii versus Trump, those are experiences that wouldn't have come to me for, for many, many years. 
But again, there are experiences that then we, we are able to use with our, with, our, um, with our clients that we can say, you know, we have these advocates who have these kind of experiences. Um, so, so I think those are sort of three personnel advantages for big law, uh, but personnel advantages are important because big law firms are their personnel. Um, and when you can uh, improve recruitment, when you can improve re uh, retention, when you can improve training, you can really improve how competitive a law firm is. Um, and, and then there are advantages, I think, in, in, in getting clients and in keeping clients. You know, it wasn't after Hawaii versus Trump, it was the, that first decision in March, it wasn't just emails from law firms. We also got emails from clients saying how glad they were that Hogan was participating in that. And as a result of um, Hawaii versus Trump, uh, there's been a lot more media attention for Hogan levels. There have been accolades, and those have sort of brought new clients, um, uh, brought us to the attention of, of, of new clients um, in a way that I think is, has made a difference for the firm and can make a difference for firms. Um, and in, to some extent, that is true for any uh, major social impact litigation. But I think that for uh, that, that, that for big law firms, immigration is a field of, of that that has a sort of particular advantages because um, many big law clients also depend on immigration for um, for the, for their workforce, and so um, immigration issues can often be very important to them as well. So there's that nice that nice synergy. Um, so so I think. There are many, many advantages for big law to, for participating in uh, immigration litigation, but there is a question of what big law is bringing to the table and why big law uh, should be participating in these things. What advantages do they, do they bring? And I want to be uh, careful in how I frame this discussion because um, I think that big law does bring many advantages to the table in this kind of litigation, but I don't think that big law should be the only voice at the table that would be that would be quite silly. Um, you know, Hawaii versus Trump has not been the Hogan Lovell show. In fact, you know, we have worked all uh, uh, in our Ninth Circuit suit. We have worked throughout the the case hand in hand with um, the Hawaii AG's office and the lawyers there, and we have worked in parallel with the um, lawyers uh, doing the Fourth Circuit case, which includes lawyers from the ACLU, the National Center for in Immigration Law, IRAP, which is a, a group that provides legal services to refugees, and many other, uh, other groups. And we've really coordinated with them heavily and drawn a lot on um, the special knowledge that they have of the immigration context. So I think I, I want to be clear in saying that the big law has many advantages for this kind of litigation when it is working hand in hand with, with, with with other with other groups, um, so what are those those oh excuse me what are those uh, advantages? The first one again, it's extremely obvious. There's a lot of resources that Big Law has. There's a lot of money. Um, there are a lot of people. Uh, uh, we have relationships with printers. Um, we have travel agents that can book those three um, different trips we had to make out to Seattle to argue in the Ninth Circuit. Um, and when a big law firm is contributing those kind of resources to this suit, when it's a big law firm that is footing the bill essentially to write those 29 briefs, which I honestly don't want to think about, you know, if, if that was a, a paying job, how much uh, how, how much money would have gone into that. Um, but, but when those resources are, resources are contributed by a, a big law firm, that means that the, there are more resources for other battles. Um, that, 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 and that, that, I think, is, is very important. But I, I don't think that it's just money that big law firms are bringing to the table. I don't think you just, it's sort of a cozying up to the, to the person with the deepest pockets. Um, I, I think there are other very real advantages that big law brings. One of those is that we, we are not immigration law specialists. Big, lawyer, big law firm lawyers generally work in a variety of different fields. Um, and there is obviously extreme advantages to being a specialist, to knowing the field deeply and well. Um, and, and as again, working with with immigration law groups um, that have that kind of knowledge has been invaluable. But there are, it is sometimes the case that there are skills, there is knowledge that we develop when we're working on other cases, on other t in other types of law that we can then transfer to, um, to the immigration cases. So for example, I had um, at almost at the same time and shortly before Hawaii been working on a major case about uh, Article Three standing and what it takes to have standing before the federal courts. 
Standing became a major issue at the beginning of the Hawaii litigation, and I had this kind of body of knowledge that I could pull on from that other field. Um, so I think those kind of diverse experiences, new, new kind of background that, that, that those who work exclusively in the immigration field may not have, I think that can make a, a really big difference. Um, I think also uh, uh, the, the, the fact that law firms are ideologically diverse can make a real difference and can really help big law firms contribute in, um, in immigration litigation. So I had the experience and I had the opportunity while working on Hawaii versus Trump to talk to colleagues who didn't think we should win. Um, to talk to colleagues who might, might be sympathetic but felt like the law should come out a different way um, or maybe weren't that sympathetic but were friendly enough with me that they were willing to sit down and talk to me about the case for a while. And I think that is um, invaluable. You know, you learn, I hope, in, in, in law school very early on that, in, that, that your arguments are better the better you understand the other side. Um, and, and getting to, to sit down and just spend hours with people saying, well, why, why would you? Why would you come to the conclusion that this is a legal order? Um, and testing out various arguments, testing out, you know, say, figuring out where the vulnerabilities and what we were saying were, and, and what were the most effective ways of responding. I think that has been, um, that, is, that is something that big law firms can contribute, that other, other groups that where happily everyone is devoted to the same outcome, is, is interested in the same outcome, and would agree that, for example, the executive order is unlawful, that the, that, 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 that opportunity isn't there. Um, the other thing is that uh, big law firms are repeat players. Um, I think they, uh, you may have heard that expression, I think I first learned it in my civil procedure class as a 1L. Um, repeat players are people who show up in front of the courts again and again and again. They know the courts, they know the court rules, they know how, to, they know the judges, they know what particular judges like. Um, they often are able to draw on a well of credibility because they appear enough in front of these judges that they, they have that that background there. And big law firms, because you know, for the litigation departments, that's, that's what we do. We show up in front of courts. They are able to, be, to, to have that kind of repeat player advantage. And I think that advantage is particularly important in immigration law because the, op the, op the opponent is always the government. And the government is the ultimate repeat player. I mean, they show up. I think they're, I haven't looked at this recently, but I'm pretty sure they're still the number one litigant. So they know the courts. They have the familiarity. And so when the, the, the people on the other side, when the people helping the, the immigrants have that same familiarity, it can make a real, a real difference, I think, in the, um, in the battle. And, uh, and, and, and finally, I think that what immigration, what big law can bring to the immigration table is a bunch of very committed immigration advocates that for one reason or another have found themselves working in big law. Um, and I wanted to close with this point because I think it could describe some people in this room. Um, I think we know that most people, uh, or not most, but many people go to law school firmly intending to work in the public sector, firmly intending to go to that nonprofit or to work for the government or, um, or to work for the ACLU. And many, many, many of those people wind up spending at least a few years in big law. Um, and, and that's not, again, because I think law school turns you into a money sucker who just doesn't care about immigration anymore. Um, I think it's usually financial realities. Uh, I think it's usual, usually practicalities. You know, law, for, law school is expensive. Law school debts are hard to pay off. Uh, I know personally daycare is expensive. Um, and, and so these practical realities, I think, wind up um, driving a lot of people who are still deeply committed to the immigration cause into big law. And when big law firms are participating in litigation like Hawaii versus Trump, those advocates have an outlet to, to, to use the, the immigration skills to, to, um, to, to exercise the passion that they have. Um, and, and I think that, that for me personally, uh, I don't think that I could have been litigating in Hawaii versus Trump except as a big law firm associate. Uh, you know, this would Again, really surprised my law, law school self, but I have two very small children, um, and when they my they were even smaller when Hawaii versus Trump began. My daughter was, I think, seven months old, and my son is, uh, was two. So really tiny people who needed a lot of my um, time and energy, and who I desperately wanted to give a lot of my time and energy to. And balancing the needs of this case against the needs of my family, that was difficult. Uh, but when I think about it, 
what made that, I think, possible, what made that, that difficult balancing job something that I could do was the financial security that I had as a big law firm lawyer. I had a salary where I could pay for daycare and I wasn't constantly worrying about our ability to make that, to, to make those payments. I could, when, when I couldn't get home to make dinner, I could order delivery. And that's, that sounds little, but believe me, when you have two screaming children, <laughs> the fact that there's food coming, uh, food right there at your house really can make the difference between a, a good night and a night where you have Gone, gone, and gone around the bed in terms of sanity, um, and so, so I think that you know that this is a reality. It, it, it shouldn't be. I, I, I very much believe that um, if if the world were fair and just, nonprofit attorneys would be paid like law firm associates, and law firm associates would be paid like nonprofit attorneys. But that isn't the world we live in. But when big law firms do give the resources, they give the people to causes like Hawaii versus Trump. We kind of get a little bit closer to that world. Um, and you know, I think uh, I wanna kind of close by going back to an idea that this symposium started with. Um, Professor David Martin talked about the need to ensure that in the immigration fights, we don't sort of let ideology um, take over and, and ignore pragmatism. I think that there is a little bit of a tendency to think that the immigration law champions should be the pure of heart. Those people, you know, you should be fighting for immigration law if you have given your whole life to immigration law, if you have forsworn all pecuniary gain, um, forsworn big law, that's who should be fighting. Um, but I think that a pragmatist looks at it and sees the resources that big law has to offer, sees the people, the money, and the ideas, and says that if we do want these major immigration cases to have a big impact, then we want big law to be involved. So thank you very much. <laughs>